welcome back to the workshop. I'm Bill. Last time we looked at theory of operation for Coleman gasoline instant light lanterns. I said we'd look at non-instant lighting lanterns next time, so that's what we're going to do. More theory of operation today, but these are lanterns that require preheating. And there are two classes of lanterns that fall in that category. The first are the gasoline lanterns like this. This is a Model 327 from the early 1920s. They were made in the years before Coleman developed their instant light system. The others are kerosene. And all of these are kerosene. This is a 249. It's a little guy. And then there's a 237. This is from 1945. And a 639 from 1980. 249s from 1948. These are all kerosene. You'll notice the similarities. In fact, the 249 and the 237 are virtually identical. This is just twice as big. The 639 is very similar to both of them. It simply uses the, the, the new burner design that Coleman introduced in 1970. The internal parts, the fuel system, are identical on all of these. And back here, our friend that's been partially disassembled He's a Model 247 from 1936, one of the very first kerosene or devoted kerosene models. Um, and uh, he's virtually indistinguishable from the 249. Um, if, you, if you're in the know, the thing you'd notice is it has a smaller generator. Uh, the, the 249 puts out less light than the, or the 249 puts out more light than the 247 does. So, all of these have a problem. They don't have the instant light circuit that reduce the fuel flow for lighting to a, a, just a minimal amount to, to prevent flare-up while still um, allowing the generator to heat up. So how do we deal with this? Well, all of these require preheating. On these, you'll see there's a, on the kerosene, all of them have a spirit cup sitting at the bottom of the generator. You fill that with alcohol, and it's used for preheating. The 327 is match lighting, and you preheat this loop with a match. We'll get to that later. Um, but first, and we've covered some of this in the previous video, but I'll cover it again for kerosene lanterns in case you're starting here. Maybe you didn't have an interest in the instant lights. The first thing we need to remember is that for combustion, we need fuel, we need oxygen. Coleman lanterns are a precision design system for delivering a combination of fuel and oxygen to create a flame that makes these mantles glow with a nice bright light. So for starters, fuel. You already know this, I'm sure. Fuel goes in the fount. That's this bottom part down here. For the kerosene models, they obviously burn kerosene. Uh, K1 clean kerosene fuel. The 327, it burns gasoline or white gas, Coleman fuel. And it's poured into this fount. Now, the 327 has a fuel cap that's a little different than the others. It doubles as a check valve for air. You'll notice, unlike most Coleman lamps you've seen, there's no internal pump. Now, the 427, which is virtually identical and came after this, was the first model to have a built-in pump that is similar to what you're familiar with. The 327 and the models before it, the, the arc lanterns and the arrow lanterns, require an external pump. The fuel cap has two pieces. You can unscrew them. This part seals the check valve. It's got a, a little pointed tip that seals it when it's screwed down. And it's got this uh, dished portion that mates to the pump. Inside the cap itself, there's a little ball bearing, just like the check valve down in the bottom of, of the pump tubes on these that we'll look at in a bit. So the pressure in the fount as it builds up pushes that ball bearing back up, and that prevents you from losing air through the valve. So put this back together. What I should note, as opposed to a rubber fuel cap gasket like modern lanterns, this has a lead gasket or a lead seal. 
So that's why this is hex shaped. It takes a 13 16th wrench because you need to put some torque on it to make sure that that lead seals well. And you'll need to put some torque on it to get it back off. So we'll screw that down. We've already got our fuel in the fount. I'll put a wrench on here and give it a little twist. Open it a couple of turns. Put the pump on. I know it doesn't seem like metal would seal against metal, but it seals well enough. And now 327 is ready to go. So let's set it aside for a bit. Let's look at this 249. It's got fuel in it as well. It's got a pump. It's got the fuel cap. You'll notice on both of these that the fuel cap is set below the bottom or, or below the top of the fount. This ensures that you can only fill it part way. In this case, about three quarters. You need some space in the top for air because we're going to pump some air into it, which I'm sure you're familiar with. We're going to pump some air into the fount. That air collects the top, and under pressure, that's what pushes the fuel out of, out of the fount and into the fuel system so it's usable. So you're familiar with these pumps, probably. You turn it anti-clockwise a couple of turns to free it up, put your thumb over the hole, and you pump it a few times, probably about 30 times will do it. And then you turn it back clockwise, and that seals it up, and then you're ready to light it. What's going on down here? What happens if, if we take these little screws out and pull the cap off and the pump components out? What's inside there? We should look at this because it's a source of a lot of common problems. This is what you'll find inside. There's a tube here. The tube runs down. A little. It's a little longer than my, my index finger, and it runs down, down at an angle into the fount. And the bottom of it is a check valve. It works just like the check valve on this 327. It's got a ball bearing in it. If you shake it, you can hear it rattle. That's a good thing. It means it's not stuck. And this threads down into the bottom. It's tight. It's slotted. Don't try to take this out with a screwdriver. You'll probably slip, and you'll uh, munge up this slot and then it's really difficult to get out. There's a tool. We'll do another video on that. But you need the proper tool to remove this check valve. It's down in the bottom. When you pump the air in, it passes through that check valve into the fount. Before it does that, on the bottom of that tube, you don't want the fuel in the, in the fount to leak back up through the check valve. So at the bottom of that tube, there's a little narrow tube that the only way you'll ever see that is if we were to cut a hole in the side of the fount. But there's a little narrow tube that comes up off the back of the pump tube and delivers the air to the top of the fount, above the level of the fuel. This is one reason why it's important that the fuel level is below the top. It's also a reason why some people do this and you shouldn't. Don't turn the lantern at an angle to get this up high so that you can completely fill the fount. I've seen that done. It's really unpleasant when you unscrew the fuel cap and it's level and fuel comes out everywhere. You need that airspace at the top. So, if you've ever had this off and you've pulled the pump assembly out, you've probably seen this square rod that sticks out. That's the air stick. This serves a couple of functions. One, this is what you're unscrewing and then screwing back in when you turn the pump knob. When it's all the way in, this pointed part mates with the check valve and acts as a double seal to make sure the air doesn't leak out. So you unscrew it to open it and then screw it back in to close it. What makes that happen, as you'll see on the pump tube, this is hollow. It's crimped in, uh, around the base to make it sort of a square shape. And that square shape grabs the air stem so that you can turn it. Now, the pump is important. And the most important part is this rubber, or rubber, leather cup down at the very bottom. This one's bone dry, it's brand new, never been used. But normally it's permeated with oil. That oil keeps it nice and flexible. That oil allows it to glide up and down smoothly in the pump tube. But most importantly, that oil helps keep this sealed against the sides of the pump tube so it doesn't leak.
So what happens is, when you unscrew this, and then lift it out on the upstroke, the leather compresses a little bit and it allows air to rush down the pump tube past the leather and it fills that void you make as you draw it out on the upstroke. Then, on the downstroke, with your thumb covering that hole so the air can't escape up through the hollow tube, you push it down and the pressure builds up and it makes this pump cup flare out. Not this much, obviously, the pump tube won't let it do that, but it, it flares out and that oil helps it seal against the sides of the tube and you push the air down and force it through the check valve into the fount. So that's what's happening as you do this. So we'll put about 30 pumps in. We've already got a few, so let's do uh, another 20. So 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20. All right, so now both of our lanterns are pressurized. But what happens now? I mean, this is where you open the valve, but what happens when you open the valve? Now we need to look at the guts, the stuff inside the lantern that you don't normally see. You've got the valve, which is normally hidden inside the collar, and if we unscrew the valve, we'll see the fuel pick up. The only time you'll ever see this is if you take the valve out. And you'll notice on a kerosene model, and the quick light is the same, and I should add the models before the quick light, the aero lanterns and the arc lanterns also have a simple fuel pickup like this. It's just a tube. It's open-ended. If you watch the instant light video, you remember it had that fancy fuel and air tube. It's a tube within a tube with an air hole at the top and a, a little tiny hole for the fuel in the bottle, and it had that, in the bottom rather, and it had that uh, uh, air wire that plugs the hole so that the instant light circuit limits the amount of fuel. This has nothing like this. When you open this valve, um, the fuel is simply going to flow out of here because of the pressure you've pumped into the top of the fount. It'll flow up the tube, into the valve, into the generator. Now what happens, and this is the same for the quick light, or the air lanterns, or the arc, as it is for the kerosene, if you do that and try to light it, you're going to have a big fireball. Now the gasoline ones are a little bit more forgiving. Like I said in the last video, gasoline uh, vaporizes or it, it boils at 98 degrees Celsius. So you get a flare-up in a gasoline model, it'll calm down relatively quickly because it doesn't take much for the generator to get up to 98 degrees. Kerosene, however, doesn't even start to boil or vaporize until it gets up to 150 degrees Celsius and it's not really running properly until it's up in the, say, 250 to 300 degrees Celsius range. That's a lot hotter. So if you try to light this by just opening the valve and putting a match to it, the kerosene is going to run down the generator, it's going to run out around the bottom of the base plate, it's going to run down under the collar, it's going to run under the fount, and if you light it, the only way you're going to get this out is with a fire extinguisher. You're going to have a huge mess. Ask me how I know sometime. So, something's got to be done about that. Well. Just like on the, um, the instant light, the generator serves the same purpose. This generator is where the liquid fuel, in this case kerosene and this gasoline, this is where it's vaporized and turned into gas. There's this little fuel tip on top that unscrews. Let's look at this. This is a 249 generator. This is just a little guy. It's got this fuel tip with a gas jet. The hole is very, very small. Depending on the lantern model, these gas jet orifices are between five and nine thousandths of an inch. So the idea is, this generator gets hot, hot enough to vaporize the fuel. That puts pressure on it because the fuel is going to uh, expand many, many times its original size once it starts getting hot in here. And that keeps it from the liquid fuel from leaking out um, and making a mess. You just get enough fuel that mixes with air coming up through these, through these air tubes and you get a nice flame. Inside the generator, on kerosene models, you have a brass spring. 
The gasoline ones typically have a, 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 a tight steel spring and a cardboard or asbestos tube around it. The, generator, or the generators on kerosene's have this brass spring and on these big boys here, um, and even on this, the larger generator, it will have another larger brass spring around the outside. Those springs help regulate the heat, but they also help keep this cleaning needle uh, centered in the generator. And this cleaning needle is actuated by this lever here. Turn it up, the cleaning lever goes up, turn it down, or the cleaning needle goes up and turn it down and it goes down. The way that works is that there's an eccentric block that it's attached to. You can see as I turn this, this little block here goes down and up and down and up. And this cleaning needle on the generator meshes with that. So when you turn it, the cleaning lever goes up and down, or the cleaning needle goes up and down. Now, on the tip of it, as we saw here, there is a tiny needle. Remember the orifice is five to nine thousandths of an inch? So that needle is even smaller. That's why it needs to be centered by that spring, because if it's not, when you raise it, it'll hit the underside of that, it'll miss the hole and get crushed. And then it's time for a new generator, most likely, because you can't always get just the needles, especially on these older ones. But that needle clears out any built-up carbon, and kerosene lanterns will build up carbon a lot faster than gasoline models. It'll clean built-up carbon out of that tiny little jet. Also, if you get impurities in your fuel or bits of carbon break loose from the, from the springs or, or the, the, the inside of the generator and get lodged there, that cleaning needle can help. So if you're running your lantern and it suddenly starts to get dim, turn this a couple of times and hopefully it'll brighten back up. That's what that's designed for. Now, that's the kerosene generator. This is where the, the fuel is heated and becomes vaporized. And of course, if you remember, kerosene requires a great deal more heat. On the, um, the quick light, these are gasoline. Again, it only needs to get up to 98 degrees Celsius. On earlier models, like the Arc and the Aero Lantern, the generators were fairly big, they were straight, and they would flood if you just opened the valve. They required preheating. And that was done with a, a little torch that was dipped in alcohol. And you'd hold it under the, under the generator, it had a little curve in the, in the tip that fit around it, and you'd hold it there for a little bit, and that would heat the generator. And then once the generator was hot, it doesn't take much, then you unscrew the valve, open it, and um, the torch will also, the flame from the torch will also cause the, the mantles to, to light up. Messing with that, that little torch in an alcohol bottle is kind of a pain. So Coleman came up in, in the early 20s, I think it was about 1920, with the Q99 generator. And you can see it's very, one, it's very narrow, so it's easy to heat up, but it's got a loop in the middle of it. It's designed so that you can take two matches, light them, and hold them un under there. It takes 10, 12, maybe 15 seconds at most, you hold them under that loop, and that's enough to preheat the generator. So as the matches start to get, as the flame starts to get to your fingers, you open the valve and the flame lights the mantles and it runs nice and beautifully. There's no flare up like there is with an instant light um, before it settles down. So you have to preheat these. Now, again, with this, you do it with the match. With the kerosene models, you need a little spirit cup. And that's what you see here. And you also see it on the 639, there's a cup there. And on the 237, there's a cup there. It takes a while for these to get up to heat. I'll show you how to light that in just a bit. But first, to remember, this is the fuel part of the combination. We also need oxygen. Now, kerosene lanterns aren't any different in this regard as far as oxygen goes. You've got two air tubes on these. There are some models, like the 201, which is based on the design of the Model 200, which we looked at in the last video. It only has one air tube, but most of these kerosene models have two air tubes. These draw in air down here. It goes up these tubes into this cast manifold. The generator, when we put this on, you'll see 
the generator mates with the manifold here. So once the gas is vaporized, it comes out of that jet under high pressure and at pretty good velocity, it goes up into this mixing chamber and down to the burner. And while it flows through, it draws air in and the air and the fuel mix in this chamber and they come out as flame here at the mantle. But how do we get the fuel up to temperature? Well, let's light this guy and I'll show you how it works. When this was new, it came with this spirit bottle. Put alcohol in there and you use this to light it. This funny shaped spout is so that it doesn't leak if it falls over. It doesn't roll at all. It, it, it'll roll a bit, but not much. But the main thing with this funny shape is that there's a light or there's a, an access hole here. Somehow you have to get the bottle in there. And if, it's, if you have something this, this design, it's going to leak if this is metal. So this is designed so that you can put it up there and then tilt the bottle. And you can see this is how you fill the spirit cup. This is a newer bottle. This is the kind that came in 1980 with the 639. It's what you would get today from Coleman with a, a, a kerosene lantern. Again, it's designed not to leak. If it falls over, the, uh, the, the spout ends up, in theory, above the alcohol. Put this up through the hole, put it over the cup, and squeeze until that cup is full. Set that aside. Now, I will light it. Now, if your lantern's really well preserved, and most of these older ones, you'll see in the side of the cup, there's a little slot cut into it. it took me a while to figure out what that is. You can put it, in the old days, they would put a little small asbestos braid and, and wedge it down into that, that notch and it would hang out this hole. And of course, it's going to absorb alcohol. And all you have to do is put a match or a lighter to that and it'll light the alcohol. You can do the same thing when you tie your mantle on and you've got leftover string from tying on the mantle. You can do the same thing with that. It won't last as long, but it'll get the same job done. You want to let the sulfur burn off the tip of the match first so that you don't leave a char mark around the main hole. And you put the match up there. Now let's talk about while, while we wait for this, and you'll see the flame is there, the mantle's starting to glow a little bit just from the alcohol flame. It takes a, a, a little while for this to heat up, so let's talk about the alcohol. I'm using methyl hydrate, straight methanol. Um, you can use denatured alcohol, which these days is usually just methyl hydrate. Um, it, in theory, um, uh, ethanol with enough methanol added to it to make it poisonous so people don't drink it. Um, you can also use gas line antifreeze, which I believe is, is basically mostly methanol. Um, a lot of people use that. I think the brand I hear passed around is heat. Um, the, the deal is you want 100% alcohol. You can use isopropanol. The problem is with the isopropyl alcohol you buy in the grocery store or the drugstore, it's usually somewhere between 70 and 91%. That means it's 30 to 9% water. It's difficult to light. I experimented with it at one point and you can get the 91% to light. It's not easy, not like this, but that water makes it smoke and you'll end up with a big sooty mess all over your generator and manifold on the underside of the globe. So ideally, find something that's 100% alcohol. Get methanol, ethanol, some gas line antifreeze, or if you can manage, find 100% isopropanol, that'll work. Now as this lights up, it's, it's about half burned down. We can talk about the mantles. Um, the mantles are silk or rayon, and they're infused with uh, metal dioxide. When you tie them on and pre-burn them, the silk or rayon burns off, it shrinks up, and what you're left with is a rigid but very fragile mesh of metal dioxide. So the mantles don't actually burn. What we want is to create a jet of flame coming out of that burner and then put on a mantle that's just the right size to take advantage of the size of the flame jet 
and the heat from it causes that metal dioxide mesh to glow. Now, in the old days, Coleman used thorium dioxide. It's radioactive. It made that nice bright white glow. Um, but it was a problem for the people who worked with it in the factories. You can tell that it's, it's mildly radioactive, so it's going to be a bit of a health risk. So in the 80s or so, they stopped using that. Now they use yttrium, which has a similar result. They're not quite as bright. But now that it's almost burned down, we're ready to open the valve. And notice, just a, a, where the instant light flares for a bit before the generator gets up to heat, this simply gives us a nice, steady, bright light right off the bat. It's important to use the right size mantle. Um, this one's actually a little bit big. I was experimenting with some of the mantles made by Peerless, um, but it works quite well. Um, if it's a small flame, you need a smaller mantle like this. If it's a really big flame, you need one of these model or number um, 111s. They're, a, they're Coleman's large mantle. These put off 550 candle power, whereas this is in the 300 candle power range. So that's the kerosene. How about the gasoline quick light? These were made in the days before Pyrex was available for globes. So if you notice, this globe is actually a, a steel frame, and it's got these panels, clear panels, inside of it. These panels aren't glass, because glass wouldn't hold up to the heat that, that the, the lantern produces. This is mica. Mica is a fireproof mineral that flakes into these very thin sheets. It's perfect for just this application. And in this case, instead of having a lighting hole underneath, because we're going to have to preheat this, these globes have a lighting door. We light two matches, and we hold them under that loop, and it should take around 15 seconds or so to preheat it. Put them together like that, and we'll hold them up at a little bit of an angle so that they, um, they don't go out. And now it should be ready. There we go. Close the lighting door. Nice and bright. So those are our gasoline and kerosene lanterns that require preheat. The quick light and uh, the kerosene 249. I hope that was helpful, and uh, next time you run into a problem, I hope there's information here that will help you trace it down, narrow it down, and pinpoint it, um, so that uh, you don't have to go through a bunch of trial and error to try to solve the problem. Uh, see you next time.